Thank you for downloading the Reach Church audio podcast from our Wednesday night encounter service. Here's this week's message from Pastor Chris Gilkey. We're going to jump right back in and finish off, actually, the book of Galatians. Tonight is going to be the final night of Galatians, and then next week we jump into the book of Ephesians. So we're going to be going through some of the smaller epistles of the Apostle Paul and really getting some serious meat out of them. Tonight is a very unique night because this is the very end of the book uh, of, of Galatians. This is just the last few verses of Galatians, and Daniel and I were kind of joking back and forth and saying, well, is there anything there that we should preach? Should we just jump straight into Ephesians? And when I read it, the Holy Spirit dropped a bomb in my spirit for tonight. It's rich. I'm telling you right now, this is a teaching night. We're going to get a lot of great information and revelation. Are you ready? Let's pick it up. Galatians chapter 6, verse 11. Notice what large letters I use. I should have used large letters in my font. And somebody gave me the short stool. I feel really weird sitting on that stool. I'm going to stand. So notice what large letters I use as I write these closing words in my own handwriting. Those who are trying to force you, and this is the the best topic we get to talk about in church, those that try to force you to be circumcised. It's such an awkward thing to talk about, isn't it? Yeah, I can tell by your silence it is. Okay? Want to, be, want to look good to others. What it's really saying, what Paul's really been teaching about when he's referring to circumcision is he's, he's talking about the law. When we get wrapped up in the people, in the religion, trying to make us conform and be bound by the law. When we're trying to be bound by the law, we lose our freedom, we lose our joy, we lose all that God and Jesus has given us in the salvation that Christ has brought us. Eric, is there any more to get in this? They don't want to be persecuted for teaching the cross of Christ alone that can save. So hear this now. Those that try to force religion really don't want to preach the truth of the cross because they know persecution comes when they preach it. And even those who advocate circumcision don't keep the whole law themselves. They only want you to be circumcised so that you can boast about it and claim as claim that you are as their disciples. Now, this is the good part. Verse 14. As for me, I never boast about anything except for the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of that cross, my interest in this world has been crucified. Hold on now. Does it mean that I shouldn't love the world? No. What it's saying is the cares of this world, the things of this world, and the world's interest, here it is, in me has also died. In other words, when I gave my life to Jesus because of that cross, I no longer care about the materialistic, sinful, soulful things of this world, and they really don't give a rip about me because they know I'm set apart now. I'm not a part of it. Not people, but the sin and the evil principalities that tried to take our life into a different direction. Verse 15, it doesn't matter whether we have been circumcised or not. And then here's what really counts. What counts is whether we have been transformed into a new creation. May God's peace and mercy be upon all who live by this principle. What's the principle? That we have been transformed into a new creation, that we are the new people of God. We're going to break down and look at what it means, what it looks like, to be transformed into a new creation. Because we have been, all that have said yes to Jesus, we have been transformed. We have been made in to something new. But this something new we're going to see isn't refurbishing the old. And we're going to look at that in just a minute. But let's look also to a sister verse of this, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, If 
anyone is in Christ, then there's a condition. If is conditional. If anyone is in Christ, then the condition to show that you are in Christ is that you are a new creation. Old things have passed away. And behold, all things, all things become new. Let's just settle here for one, one moment. Old things have passed away. That means that every sin, every mistake that you have ever made, every stinking thinking, every, every pessimistic spirit about you, everything that was standing against God and his promise for you, they have passed away. They've died. They're dead. They're gone. But behold, all things become new. What does that mean, all things? What are all things? How many things are all things? Right? In the great words of Porky Pig, that's all, folks, right? All is all. And all ever, the, all that ever can be is all. All can never be part. All can never be half. All can never be almost all. All is all. So what does that look like? That means that if you lost your virginity before Jesus, when you came into Jesus, your new creation is a purified virgin before him. That means that, that whatever you did, if you were, if you were a, a wild partier or you know a violent person before Jesus, that means when you came into him, he no longer sees any bit of that in you. Now he sees this loving, caring, peaceful person. Are y'all hearing me? I know I'm ruffling feathers. You mean Jesus can give me my virginity back? Heck yes, he can. Because it says all things are new. He'll give you your mind back. He'll give you your willpower back. He'll give you the things that, that have once been tainted or taken away from you. He will give you each and every one of them back because all things are become new. The word therefore, it began with that. The word therefore, it refers back to something. The word therefore means, okay, I've talked about something else. Now I'm going to talk about this. But to set this up, I need to tell you, remind you about what I just said. And he's reminding us about what he said in 2 Corinthians 14, 15. Christ love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to our old life. He died for everyone so that those who receive him. So this right here wipes out this crazy, nasty gospel, fake gospel message that's taking place in too many churches that Jesus gave his life for all. That means nobody goes to hell. Everybody goes to heaven. But look what he says. He died for everyone. Yes, he did. But those who receive him, those who believe in him, they receive his new life. And they no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ, who died and was raised for them. What, what, what is this saying, folks? Here it is. Our lives are no longer worldly. When Jesus gives us a new life, our lives are no longer worldly. They are now spiritual. Next slide, guys. They are now spiritual. Our death is that of the old sin nature, which was nailed to the cross with Christ. That new life that he's speaking of was raised up in us is our new creation. So our lives are no longer worldly. God doesn't see us. Our spirit, which was once dead, now, be, now came to life upon salvation. So God's now lo looking at you as a soul. He's looking at you as a spirit. Because you're dead to the old sinful nature. Romans 6, verse 4. For we died and we were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. I'm going somewhere with this because I think that in our church, 
we're pretty relevant and we don't use the words a whole lot around here that we're born again or we are a new creation. But the, the hardcore facts are we are. But what does that mean to you? What does that look like? What is it? Well, how does that happen? What what takes place and, and and what is it? What does it mean for the rest of your life and for your future? And look at this. A new creation. This is it. A new creation is, in fact, a creation. It's not a restoration. He didn't say that you are a restoration in me. He said that you are a new creation. That means that God created something new in you. When you give your life to Jesus, God does a creative work within your being and he brings your spirit to life and now he has created a new you. Look at this, John 113. They are reborn not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. What was the first birth to come from God? Jesus. He created Adam out of the dirt, created Eve from the rib, but he birthed Jesus through the womb. He was the first born of all creation. So God created his son's spirit into human form and gave us this amazing gift in this earth. And just like that, God gives you a brand new creation. You are no longer who you used to be. Well, we shouldn't be at least, right? We can't, we can't identify this is what should take place. When people meet you after being saved, when people meet you, they should recognize in their heart, in their eyes, they should not be able to recognize you as the old you that they once knew. I'll never forget when I went back to Youngstown, Ohio, to youth pastor, and we did this big night uh, it was a huge night for, for young adults and teenagers and, and, and all kinds of people from the church were just pouring in because they wanted to be a part of it. And, and I had a, a guest, uh, a worship team in, Eddie James and his ministry was in, and, and we were having this amazing night. And I get up at the beginning of the service, and, and I just let everybody know what's about to happen in the format, what's about to go down. I get everybody fired up, and somebody walks up to me and goes, can you come with me, please? And I said, yeah. And, and they take me to the, to the back of the room, and there's this girl sitting there like this. I mean, literally, like mouth all dropped wide open, eyes as big as golf balls, and she can't talk. It's like, and I'm like, hello. And, and the, the lady introducing us goes, you're Chris Gilkey, right? Yeah. Like, the Chris Gilkey that grew up here. You're, yeah. Yeah. The, the, the Chris Gilkey that married Melissa to call, yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's me. She doesn't believe me. And the girl's still sitting there going. And I'm like, do I know you? And she goes, we went to high school together. But I don't know you. I'd like, I don't know you. I, I know this guy, Chris Gilkey, that I went to high school with, but I don't know you. And it was one of the greatest compliments to, to me about the work that Jesus did. Because no person can do that. Nobody can transform you into this brand new creation. So a new creation is, in fact, a creation. God has created a miracle in each and every one of you. He birthed you forth with a miracle. God did not simply, listen to this, God did not simply clean up our old nature. He didn't dress us up, wash us off. He created something entirely fresh and unique. And this new creation is completely new. Brought about from nothing is what the, what the word means. Just as the whole universe was created by God. Th this Greek word here, it stands, it, it means out of nothing. And this is new creation. This is the two Greek words, ex nihilio. It, it means a new creation brought 
out of nothing. In other words, God didn't come in and fix you up. It's not like build or, or going into a home and, and fixing it up into the home that you've always wanted. It's like literally tearing the house down, completely destroying every fabric of that entire house and erecting you a brand new house from scratch. And only the creator could accomplish such a miracle. So number two, old things have passed away. So you are a brand new creation. God did a creative miracle in your life. And old things, they have passed away. And this word old, it refers to everything that is a part of our old nature. Pride, love of sin, reliance on works, our former opinions. You know, everybody can have an opinion, but when you give your life to Jesus, it's your time to align your opinions with his word. Come on now. Not with society. Not with pop culture, not with your neighbor, not with your bestie, but it's time to align your opinions with the word of the living God. I don't have an opinion. I have the word of God. Are you hearing me? It's also your habits and your old passions. Most importantly, what we loved has passed away. Not people, not, not the good things we love, but the, the things that we loved a part of our old nature. Self-righteousness, self-promotion, self-justification, self, self, self. The new creature looks upward towards Christ instead of inwardly towards itself. What do you mean by that? That means when we give our life to Jesus, we look to him for our, our identity. We look to him for our opinion. We look to him to be our guide. We look to him to be our passion. Are you hearing me? The old things died. They were nailed to the cross with that old sinful nature. Look at Colossians 3.9. Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all of its wicked, de wicked deeds. Ephesians 4.24. Put on your new nature. So you strip off the old nature. You put on the new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. And number three, what about a Christian who continues to sin? What if we are a new creation, we are a new creature in Christ, but we continue to live or we continue to just sin or live in sin, there is a difference between continuing to sin and continuing to live in sin. We nailed this hard on, I think, three or four Wednesdays ago with the leave it at the well message. We remember the, the, the lady who had been married five times living with a man who wasn't even her husband, and she was coming to the well at the wrong time of the day. She was coming when men were supposed to be at the well drawing water because she was looking for number seven. And Jesus confronted her in love. And he exposed her by the word of knowledge. And then he gave her an, a revelation that he is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. And she was so rocked by it. And then what did he tell her? Go and sin no more. And it says she left her pot at the well and she went and told everybody about Jesus. She left her excuse to sin. She left her reason, her point of contact to sin at that well where it belonged, and she ran out. Do you think that everybody that she says, she told everyone about Jesus. Do you think that everyone knew who this lady was? She, I think they probably did. Yeah, and not in the best of way, not probably the highest opinion. Can you imagine, can you imagine if you personally knew a prostitute? And that prostitute, you, you were trying to help, you were trying to coach, you were trying to lead out of that lifestyle and into God's gift of new life, and, and it just never worked. And then all of a sudden one day you're in Starbucks drinking coffee, and she runs into the, into the room and starts telling everybody about Jesus. You would either think she's crazy, or you would think something dramatic has taken place in her life that's radically changed her life. So when we... Sin as a Christian, 
that's not the same as living a lifestyle of sin. We've covered this a lot at Reach Church. We all sin. We all are going to fall short. We all are going to make mistakes, and we're going to continue to do so not intentionally and not as a lifestyle. Those are the two major danger zones because we read in Galatians 5 that no one living a lifestyle of sin can inherit the kingdom of God. So if we have our old nature crucified, if we have our old self stripped off, then our new self should be doing and about doing new things in God and not letting ourselves get bound up and get trapped back into the old lifestyles of sin. Not that you're not going to make a mistake, but that you're not going to dwell and, be, and form a habit in that mistake. So when we do this, when we give God this new person, when he gives us this new creation and we put our best foot forward, then we begin to see major, major breakthroughs in our life. Look at Romans 6, 6 through 7. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin, here it is, might lose its power in our life. How do we, how do we gain power over sin? By crucifying ourselves with Christ. That doesn't mean physically, it means soulfully and spiritually. It means that we're going to die to what we want to do, and we're going to accomplish what God wants us to do. Am I making sense here? This is, this is the heart of becoming a disciple. This is not a message for new believers. This is a message for folks that have come out on a Wednesday night and said, I want more. And this is more. This is the next level. If you feel like you're stuck in your spiritual walk, if you feel like you're struggling in your faith, this message tonight is how to step up and in to a brand new level. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. So when we, when we died with Christ, not just when we got saved, but when we died, when we said, Jesus, take the wheel, right? Carry Underwood. Just throwing it out there. Romans 6, verse 11 through 12. So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. Do not, do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to those sinful desires. Do not let sin control control the way you live. We talk about this a lot. We are made of three parts, body, soul, and spirit. Our body is our earth suit. It is our flesh and bones. It is what God has given us to get us around on this earth. But this body will remain in this earth, and we will be given a new body fit for glory in heaven. The two other parts of us that go on for eternity are our soul and our spirit. Our soul is our mind, our will, our emotions, and it relates to others. And then our spirit is our new creation, and it relates directly to God. If I allow the Holy Spirit to lead my life, then I am a spirit-led Christian. If I allow my old sinful nature to lead and control my life, then I am a carnal Christian. I still believe, I'm still redeemed, but I'm dangerously playing a game that in the end, only Jesus and Jesus alone will have the yes or the no for you when you stand in front of him. Come on now. So when we, when we give our life to Christ, folks, this is not hellfire brimstone, turn to burn, you better get it right. This is why don't you want to live this amazing new life? life. Because let's be honest, sin only does a few things. One, it feels good for a season, the Bible says. And when that season is over, we feel worse than when it began. Sin hurts people, hurts ourselves, and hurts others. And sin, listen to this now, sin, sin just doesn't hurt people. Sin isn't just, sin isn't just separating us from God, but sin is making us feel like crap. It makes you feel shameful and guilty. 
You walk around filled. If you know it, you know it as well as I do, you know it. When you blow it, you feel nasty. Especially, especially once, 100% once, you give your life to Jesus. And again, making a mistake doesn't out you. It doesn't oust you. It doesn't alienate you. It doesn't excommunicate you. But when we allow ourselves to fall back in to that lifestyle of sin, that's when we begin to walk that dangerous line. Are you hearing this? So it's like I'm not preaching at you. I'm preaching with you just so you know. I ask myself this all the time. Why do you still allow this to happen in your life? And then I talk like this to myself, knucklehead. Like, you know, you know, I had a, uh, I had a moment in, 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 in Cedar Park about a week ago. Me and, and Candace and Aaron were grabbing a bite to eat at 1890 Ranch, and, and somebody smacked Melissa's car pulling in and then didn't even move the car. They, they parked like that, that far from us, like that far. I couldn't even get in my door. Yeah, her brand new car. That was a blessing. All the paint taken off the, the part of the, the, the quarter panel. And it's a white car. And this green van parked right next to it, like that close to it. And I walk up and I look at the green van. It's got a big swath of white paint on the bumper. One plus one equals two, you know? So I'm not, I'm not even upset. I'm really not angry. Accidents happen. Okay. I'm a little frustrated that they didn't leave something on the window, hey, this is my license plate, this is my car, I accidentally hit your car. So I call the police because I don't know where anybody's at in the whole center, and I'm wanting just to put a report on it, and we wait for the the police for only an hour and 15 minutes in 98 degree weather. I'm starting to sweat, I'm starting to stink, and I'm getting frustrated, and so then me and Aaron split up and we started going, because I realized somebody's probably not shopping this long, they're probably working here. And we find the person working there, and the manager of the person working there just tells me flat out, it's impossible. This, this person's been here all day long, and they've never clocked out. But then the guy says, no, no, I, I just got here. But I didn't hit your car. At least I don't think I hit your car. And then it starts, you know, I'm going, okay, well, let's just let the police figure all this out, and we'll wait. But then the manager, who isn't even involved in the situation, starts being, like, incredibly rude and belligerent to me in the parking lot, and he starts telling me, you're, you're some kind of crook. You drove around this parking lot and, and looked for a car with white paint on it so you could park next to it and blame that person. I'm like, dude, are you being for real right now? This guy just told you he parked here after I was already here. That, that, that's not, he goes, no, you're a liar. And then, whoo! I'm getting hot right now thinking about it. Whoo! And it just hit me. And like the Jesus Chris Gilkey was like, bye. And the Marine Chris Gilkey was like, hello. And I was like, dude, are you testing me? And he looked at me and he goes, what? I go, are you testing me? Don't test me. And Aaron's like, dude, trust me. Don't test him. Don't test him. <laughs> and Candace is back. Behind me, scratching my back. Ooh, daddy, daddy. He's not testing. He's not testing, daddy. He's not testing. And this dude goes something like, you, you, you think I'm afraid of you because you're all swallowed up? I'm like, bro, you better be afraid. You better be very afraid. If you say one more word, I'm going to teach you that you should have been afraid. Just be quiet, you know. Just shut your mouth. And thank the Lord. For my, my life and, and, and my, my calling, the, the dude was afraid and he shut up. But it was there. I'm telling you, I, I ain't felt it in a long time, but it was right there. I was one moment away from going 100% stupid. Ruining my life. Ruining, ruining my, 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 my credibility to pastor. Do you hear this? Sin was knocking. It was kicking down my door. And I was open. I was just cracking it just a little bit, but I had my foot there, you know, just, just, just a little bit. But that's the old nature. That's my old nature. That, that, that's the guy that my wife and others knew before Jesus got a hold of me. And I promise you, 
not in a weird, bragatory way. I'm just telling you, I don't even want that old guy to come out. That old guy is mean, and he, is, he doesn't have an off switch. It's like the, uh, the Incredible Hulk. Like, David Banner's nice. Let's keep David Banner here. You know what I mean? Oh, babe, don't admit that out in public. My wife just said, I like it, though. That is how Melissa, I don't know if I've ever told you guys a story. This is really crazy, but I'm just going to jump into it real quick because it's absolutely funny. So this is how I was, I, I, you know, you guys know we were high school sweethearts, but it didn't start off as sweethearts. It started off with, with her cussing me out because I asked her why she had purple hair. And, and then we became friends, and then we hung out for a couple years, and then we started dating our senior year. And she was dating me. She liked me, but she had a big, bad dad. And she thought, well, I don't know if this guy can handle it, and, you know, handle things and protect me, be a protector for me like my dad would be. And then one day in a high school basketball game, one thing led to another, and both schools got in a parking lot, and there was this huge brawl. And the biggest dude in the parking lot was calling me out. The biggest dude in the parking lot. He's just yelling, kill, kill. He looked like freaking Goliath. And it was snowing out, and, and, and Melissa's like, don't go. Don't go. I'm like, girl, let me go. She's holding on to my jacket. You know, my Letterman's jacket. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> so she's holding on to my Letterman's jacket. And I'm like, let me go. She's like, don't go. You're going to get killed. And then it just, oh, you don't even know, girl. So I slid out of that jacket. I'm just telling you, I ran. I flew through there like Superman, knocked this cat out. I got back in the car after the whole thing was all done, and she was like, I love you. <laughs> I'm like, what? She's like, I do. I love you. True story, she says. Yeah. That's how my wife fell in love with me. Me knocking some big dude out. Yeah, she had me at the first she said, You had me at the first punch. All right. So let's talk about the nuts and bolts of this. How do we make this practical, folks? We are a new creation. We have been given this amazing gift of a new life. How do we capitalize on it? How do we live out this new life as a new creation? Because if a new creation is created from nothing and made into something and given within us, and we are given this fresh start, this new beginning, how do we live this out? And I got three sub points to number four, and the first one is A, and it is embrace transformation. Do you know that 86% of the population of the world hates change? They hate transformation. They, 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 people are, are afraid of it. People are weary of it. They're leery of it. They're, uh, they're, cons they're concerned about what it would look like. But look at Romans 12, 1 and 2. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your lives to God because of all that he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind that he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. How do we worship God the best? By living out the life that God has called us to live, that he has given us this new life. We give God the best of us when we become that living sacrifice for him. When we sacrifice our old desires, when we sacrifice, we crucify our old sinful nature. We sacrifice those things and we say, God, I'm in. 100%. I, I, I'm not going to get it right every time, but I'm going to give you my best every time. And then look at this. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy. Do not copy the behavior and customs of this world. Do you know why? Because the Bible also teaches us that the God of this world is Satan. And that this world system, not the kingdom, the world system, it is governed by him. He's the one and all of his fallen angels. They're the ones promoting and pushing and using people to get it done. But this is, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you. Let God transform you into a new creation. There's something so big that we're going to talk about here in the next point. Let God transform you 
into a new creation. You ever watch Transformers? It's not instantaneous, is it? Even though they're like fake ro robots, they transform. It takes time. They go from a car into a robot or from a plane into a robot or whatever that is. It takes time. It's a process. And God is telling us right here, listen to this, but let God transform you into. So let God. So this, this isn't just up to me. It's up to me letting God transform me into a new creation. He's going to do that. It's a process by changing. How does he do it? By changing the way you think. Why is it so important to change the way that you think? Because if you hold on to thoughts long enough, then those thoughts get into your heart. And the scripture says that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And the scripture goes on to say that our words have power of both life and death. So if I don't control my thoughts, if I don't allow God to change the way that I think, then I'm really living a carnal Christian life because I'm doing it my way. Just me and Frank Sinatra all alone, right? But if I give God the opportunity to help me through time, over the process, change the way that I think, then the thoughts that I have are going to be focused on the things they should be focused on, and then it's going to get into my heart, it's going to come out of my mouth, and it's going to become relevant in my life. Then you will learn to know God's will for you. So many people say, I don't know God's will for my life. The only way to know God's will is to give him your life as a living sacrifice and allow him to transform you by renewing your mind, by transforming your thoughts. And his will, it is good, pleasing, and perfect. If I live out my will, I'm going to be disappointed heartbroken. I'm going to hurt others. I'm going to have too many failures. But when I allow God to live his will out in my life, because here's the thing about God, he knows everything. He knows what's best for us. He knows the dangers that lie before us. So there's times where we, we may feel like, yeah, I really want to do this. And you feel that, that nudge on the inside that you shouldn't. And you push through that nudge and do it anyway. It never turns out good. You know the old expression, go with your gut? You know where that comes from? Because the Holy Spirit dwells within the innermost part of your being. That's where Jesus is living right now. Jesus is living in your spirit, in your, in your heart. So when you get that gut check, when you get that queasiness, when you get that uneasiness, not fear, not, not, not fear of doing something that God's called you to do, but we're talking about when you know, when you know that you know, that this may not be the best idea, or this may not be God's idea, and you're getting checked on it, and when you push through that, then you're out on your own because you've left the path that God has laid and laid before you. Look at this. B, understand it's a daily process. Nobody's transformed completely overnight. I was a completely individual. From the moment before I got saved to the moment I was saved, I was radically changed. But I have transformed so far beyond even the young man that gave his life to Jesus in 1998. I'm a completely, I hope, better husband, better father, better human being, better leader, better follower, better servant. You know, because this is a continuous and daily process. Look at Luke 9, 23. Then he said to the crowd, if any of you wants to be my follower." my disciple, not just my believer, but those that are going to be with me, then you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross daily, and follow me. What does it mean, take up your cross daily? It means you're crucifying your old sinful nature daily. How am I doing that? By following God's nature, his new creation that is within me by being spirit-led. Is this making sense? And look at C. Last one. Fix your eyes on Jesus. 
I tell folks all the time, I went to the school of the Spirit before I went to any seminary and earned any degrees. The Holy Spirit would just tell me. I, would, I asked the Holy Spirit immediately the day I got saved, what do I do from now on? And here's what he told me. Fix your eyes on Jesus. And then I read the Bible and I said, hey, that's Bible. That's Scripture. It's right there. Look at Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down. You know what sin does? Sin slows you down. Especially the sin that so easily trips us up. You know what that means? It means those, those little niches, those, those old lifestyles of sin, those things that, that used to be a major part of your lifestyle. The devil, if you were, if, if you were me, if I, for me, if, if, if anger and, and outburst of anger was a lifestyle, and it was a lifestyle of sin in my life, you know, and, and gossip wasn't, which it really wasn't. Never has been. But I got my own. I'm not judging anyone that's dealing with gossip, but I got my own. You guys hear about these three preachers, right? They all came together. <laughs> these all three preachers came together. And they were having a, a Bible study, and one of the preachers came up with the idea that we should all confess our sins one to the other, like the Bible says, so that we may be healed. And the first guy says, all right, look, I got, I got something to confess. I, I love to gamble. I go to Vegas all the time. Cha-ching. I gamble like crazy, and I take the church's money to do it. These guys are like, what? You know? And the other guy's, man, that's really bad. I don't feel so bad for telling you this, but I never write my own sermons. I, I listen to other people's sermons, and I steal them, and, and, and I tell other people that they're mine. And the third guy goes, man, you guys are really messed up. My only sin is gossip. <laughs> yeah. So if I have outburst of anger as a lifestyle of sin, and all of a sudden, if, the, if Satan, look what it says here. Listen to what it says. Let us strip off every way that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. If, I allow, if, if, if the devil wants to trip me up, he's not going to try to get me to gossip because it's never been a part of any nature of my being. But the one that so easily trips me up is anger. You know, and, and he, can, he can get that with just... Austin drivers mostly do that for me. They, 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 I mean, him. That's his agents. Austin drivers are the devil's agents <laughs> against my life. <laughs> I love you, Austin drivers, if you're out there. All right. So let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. What does that mean? It means God has set a path before you. He set a purpose within you. He has given you a plan. He, is, he has an amazing plan for your life. We're talking about this on Sunday morning. He has an amazing plan for your life. And if you're going to accomplish that plan, if you're going to see that plan come to fruition, then you cannot let sin weigh you down, slow you down, and especially that that so easily trips you up because you're not going to get where God has destined you to be. Verse 2, we, we do this. How do we do this? How do we, how do we not let sin weigh us down? How do we not let it slow us down? How do we not let that familiar sin so easily trip us up? We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Jesus is victorious. He has defeated sin. He has defeated lifestyles of sin. He has defeated your old sinful nature. He gives us a fresh start, a new beginning, washes us as white as snow, strips off the old, and puts in a brand new created you. And he gives you this path, this race to run, this purpose, this plan for you to be able to become the one that God has put you on this earth to be. And what he's telling you is this. If you'll just 
keep your eyes on me and stop looking at the short skirt that rolled by. If you keep your eyes on me and stop trolling Facebook looking for gossip. Are you with me? If you keep your eyes on me and stay out of the bar where you know that you had trouble one too many times. If you keep your eyes on me, if you fix them, focus them, attach them to me, I am victorious, which means then you will be victorious over your old sinful nature. Why? Because you're a new creation. You are a walking, breathing miracle. Every one of you, every one of us here tonight, we are a brand new person in Jesus. We are a miracle. We, we, we have defied all odds. We have defied the devil's strategies. And we have been given this amazing, incredible, faith and fun filled life to live. This race that we have been purposed to run, it lies before us. So let's strip off the weight and let's run as fast and as steady as we can to be able to do what he's purposed us to do. We hope you enjoyed this message from Reach Church. For more information or to contact us, visit reachchurch.com. If you live in or are visiting the Austin area, we hope to see you soon at one of our services.